Hello. In this video, we are going to prove limit as x squared to c of x to the n is equal to c to the n using the epsilon delta definition of a limit. Now, we are going to say that n is a positive integer. And the function we are working with is f of x equals x to the n over the domain of real numbers. Now, by the epsilon delta definition of a limit, this means the following. It means for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that for all x in the real numbers, if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, then absolute value of x to the n minus c to the n is less than epsilon. Now, to prove this, it might be useful to understand how we can manipulate absolute value of x to the n minus c to the n. And so to understand how we can manipulate this, we are first going to prove a preliminary result. And to see the preliminary result we are going to prove, let's consider two arbitrary real numbers, a and b, an arbitrary positive integer n, and an arbitrary real number, capital N, such that absolute value of a and absolute value of b are both less than or equal to capital N. And from here, we are going to consider the formula for a to the n minus b to the n. If we recall, this is what it is. And we're going to actually write what this is in summation notation instead. So we have this. But we are going to consider the absolute value of this guy. Now, we know that the absolute value of a product is the same thing as the product of absolute values. So, we have this. And now, let's apply the triangle inequality. The triangle inequality tells us that the absolute value of a sum is less than or equal to the sum of absolute values. So, we have this. But now, we know that if we take an arbitrary term of this sum, we can re-express this guy in a different way, right? Again, applying the product property for absolute values, this guy is just equal to this. And then another property of absolute values tells us we can pull the exponent to the outside of the absolute value. So we have this. And so we're going to replace this arbitrary term with this. And now we're going to show that every term of this sum is less than or equal to a particular value. So to show that, let's consider an arbitrary term of this sum again. Now, we know that absolute value of A is less than or equal to capital N, and absolute value of B is less than or equal to capital N. And let me just note that these guys are both greater than or equal to zero, and now, we are going to apply the following property of real numbers. Suppose we're given two real numbers, capital A and capital B, and we're given that capital N is an integer greater than or equal to zero. Well, if this is true, then this is true. So applying this fact to the first inequality, we have that absolute value of A to the power of N minus one minus K is less than or equal to capital N to the power of n minus one minus k. And then applying this fact to the second inequality, we have that absolute value of b to the power of k is less than or equal to capital M to the power of k. And let me again note, these guys are both greater than or equal to zero. So now we are going to apply another property of real numbers, which is the following. Suppose we have four real numbers, A, B, C, and D. Well, if this is true, then this is true. So from here, we can say that the product of these two guys is less than or equal to the product of these two guys. And then from properties of exponents, this is just capital M to the power of N minus one. So what have we shown here? Well, we started out by considering an arbitrary term of this sum. And we showed that this arbitrary term 
must be less than or equal to capital N to the power of n minus 1. And since this term is arbitrary, we have shown that every term of this sum is less than or equal to capital M to the power of n minus 1. And therefore, the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of this guy is less than or equal to the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of capital M to the power of n minus 1. Now, in the sum, all we're really doing is we're adding capital M to the power of n minus 1 by itself n times because there are n integers between 0 and n minus 1. So this sum is really just n times capital M to the power of n minus 1. So we get this. So what have we shown here? We have shown, given any two real numbers a and b, given any positive integer n, and given any real number capital M with these two properties, it follows that this guy is less than or equal to this guy. And so we're going to use this fact to prove this limit. So now let's get into proving this limit. And to prove this limit, all we have to do is prove this statement. And since we're trying to prove a statement about every epsilon greater than zero, let's give ourselves an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. And from here, we want to find a delta greater than zero such that this is true. Now, let's pretend as though we've already figured out what to choose delta to be. And with this choice of delta, we want to show for all x in the real numbers, if zero is less than absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, then absolute value of x to the n minus c to the n is less than epsilon. And to show that, let's give ourselves an arbitrary real number x such that 0 is less than absolute value of x minus c is less than delta. And from here, we want to show that absolute value of x to the n minus c to the n is less than epsilon. And in the process of showing this, we're going to figure out how we should define delta. We're going to end up defining delta so that delta is the smallest element in a list of positive numbers. Now, let's first restrict delta so that delta is less than or equal to absolute value c plus 1. With the restriction, delta is less than or equal to absolute value c plus 1, well, we know that absolute value of x minus c is less than delta. And by the reverse triangle inequality, we know that this is true. And further, we know that absolute value of x minus absolute value of c is less than or equal to the absolute value of itself. So this shows that absolute value of x minus absolute value of c is less than absolute value of c plus 1. Adding absolute value of c to the other side, we get absolute value of x is less than 2 absolute value of c plus 1. Also, we certainly know that absolute value of c is less than 2 absolute value of c plus 1. And from here, let's apply our preliminary result. We're going to take a to be x, we'll take b to be c, we'll take n to be n, we'll take capital M to be 2 absolute value of c plus 1. And with these choices, we know that absolute value of A is less than or equal to capital M, and absolute value of B is less than or equal to capital M. That's precisely what these two inequalities are telling us. So, we can conclude that this inequality is true. So, replacing A with X, B with C, N with N, and capital M with 2 absolute value of C plus 1, we have... this. Now, we know that n is positive, and certainly 2 absolute value of c plus 1 to the power of n minus 1 is positive, because we have a positive number to the power of an integer greater than or equal to 0. Right? So, this entire thing is positive. And therefore, since absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, it follows that absolute value of x minus c times this guy must be less than delta times this guy. Right. 
And now all we have to do is restrict delta so that delta is less than or equal to epsilon over this guy. Because with delta less than or equal to epsilon over this guy, we have this. And this is just equal to epsilon. And this shows that as the value of x to the n minus c to the n is less than epsilon, which is exactly what we wanted to show. And so with this choice of delta, this argument will follow. So we have shown that this entire statement is true, which proves limit as x per to c of x to the n is equal to c to the n. And so this completes the proof. And so yeah, that's pretty much it for this video.